we've already heard Hedla your opening remarks and on why it's important today, but we're going to talk about the DigiGem project that's building on the ecological system theory by Brunen, Brun, Brunton Brenner. I'm not able to pronounce that terribly well, which places the child within a system of relationships and interactions for their development. Um, so explain a bit more, Hedla, for us how DigiGen takes this theory and, and runs with it. Right, thank you, Jennifer, I appreciate that. And uh, yes, it's not an easy name to say, Bronfenbrenner. Um, but thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And I really like to thank, uh, of course, our uh, last speaker, Sarah, um, who has sort of laid a little bit the foundation for what I'm going to talk about now. Um, and I will also make a little bit of links, a uh, few links to her uh, presentation, as well as to the rest of the presentations um, that will follow. But as noted to in today's program, I'm focusing my presentation on the e ecological systems theory developed by Bronfenbrenner. And for Digigen, it was really important to consider how to understand the everyday lives of children and young people, which for us meant placing them in a system or within a system of relationships and interactions they have with the world around them and the technology that has become an important part of their lives and all of our lives actually. Whether a certain aspect of digital technology is positive or negative, we believe it's influenced by, among other things, the relational systems in everyday lives. One thing that seems to be clear is that the technology is changing individuals and their relationships. With the growth of digital technology, there are both benefits and risks. While the risks of such technology have been well documented, and include negative health effects on sleep, attention and learning, as well as exposure to inaccurate, inappropriate or unsafe content and contacts and compri uh, compromise privacy and confidentiality. Many of these risks are related to innate or situational variables. In a recent article by Laura Robinson and her colleagues, which came out just now in 2020, they po also point to a to new forms of vulnerability that emerged due to the COVID pandemic. The result is those who lack digital access or what they call unconnected have higher risks associated with the pandemic, including but not limited to economic insecurity and non COVID related diminished well being, learning gaps, as well as skill and competency disparities that are likely to occur among disadvantaged students. And I think this is really something important for us to keep in mind. Thus, digital in, uh, inequalities have emerged as a growing concern in our societies. These inequalities are related to disparities in access, actual use, but also outcomes. Reducing digital inequalities is critical for sustainable digitalized societies in Europe, but also beyond. All types of digital inequalities are encompassed in the term digital divide. And while there are several other concepts that are relevant and related, such as digital inclusion, e-inclusion, digital exclusion, digital inequality, digital poverty, and digital capital, we at DigiGen have focused on digital deprivation, something you have heard about from our last speaker. Yet, uh, Digigen, we are not only concerned with the negative aspects of digital technology. Our overall goal is to develop significant knowledge about how children and young people use and are affected by technological transformations, as I said earlier today, in their everyday lives. So we aim to achieve this goal through the use of participatory methodologies that focus on understanding why and how some children and young people benefit from ICT use while others have been negatively impacted. For our work, it encompasses several levels of the digital divide. And the early digital divide literature focused on inequalities in access uh, in accessing the internet as dependent on socioeconomic as well as cultural differences. What is known today as the first level divide. According to these preliminary findings, uh, they showed how the most socially advantaged people were the first to acquire technology 
and to access information and communication technologies. The COVID pandemic this last year has in fact shown us that we have not solved this divide. <laughs> However, with the diffusion of ICTs and the spread of the internet, some scholars expand this first level definition by including different uses of the internet and possession of different grades of digital skills, what is known today as the second level digital divide. And it is this second level divide showed as a digital stratification and inequalities in terms of both internet usage and online participation. We hope to share some insights about how children and young people are using the technology and the forms that their online participation is taking. Some of that you will hear about later on today. Finally, researchers have also identified third level digital divide that refers to inequalities in terms of the benefits, and that's the important part, and concrete outcomes that users can, users can gain from ICT usage. Here is where we have too little research and where DigiGen hopes to add some uh, to the research field on how some children and young people then benefit from this technology. But how do we gain knowledge about children and young people's use and how they are affected by technology? In our research, we argue there is a need to consider the value of digital activities, along with ideal uses of technology that form a bridge between the various ecosystems surrounding the digital generation and the technology itself, shown here in our infographic. So as you can see, the children are placed in the center and the different technology and the different areas of their lives are surrounding them in different ways. While not the first scholar to describe the impact of environments on systems, Bromfenbrenner outlined how each system connects to and interacts with each other. Bromfenbrenner's model, which Dig Digigen builds on, consists of five different systems embedded within each other. Development, therefore, results is the result of interaction of personal characteristics and one's context. In the center of is the individual. The easiest place to see where technology effects can be observed is in the chrono system. That is the system where environmental changes occur over the lifetime, which influence the development, including major life transitions and major historical events. The advent of technology has shifted the way we think in this era and is evidenced by phrases such as the age of technology, the digital age, the computer age, the information age, as well as the digital revolution. We are currently living in a digital culture that has established many new rules, customs, lifestyles related to computers or computation, information storage, and information transmission. At the same time, the internet's accessibility and one's daily contact, perhaps maybe even described as intimate contact with devices suggests the effect of the internet might also be addressed among some of the intimate levels in Bronfenbrenner's ecological model, because they involve more than just general trends and overarching cultural shifts. The placement of technology in our lives transcends each of these layers and consequently affects development for both individuals as well as families. In 2010, Johnson presented an initial version of this construct and ec uh, under the term ecological techno subsystems, uh, which DigiGen has also made use of. In this construct, John uh, Johnson describes Bronson Brenner's system in a kind of slightly different way. So Johnson proposes a technological subsystem that is embedded within the microsystem. This level branches out into the microsystem, which is described as the immediate environment, then effects spill out into the mesosystem or the element that is in connection between the systems. And for DigiGen, we argue that through technology, children and young people also influence the ecological systems around them. Thus, the techno subsystem influences the macro system layer, which in turn influences the meso system layer, then influencing the exosystem layer, and then on to the macro again. So, in other words, we have these sort of intersecting uh, connections. 
Nearly 30 years though, after Bronfenbrenner's ecological model, Taylor in 2008 proposed another model describing how we interact with the world around us. Taylor's model builds on the work of Baxter Magdola, Keegan, but as, as well as Bronfenbrenner and offers a more in-depth look at psychological and sociological factors surrounding the de development of college-aged youth. Now we are looking at children and young people, but certainly I think Taylor's work is also relevant here in sort of developing our model further. Taylor expounded on the levels identified by Bronfenbrenner and Taylor classified these variables as occurring in one of two dimensions individual variables and environmental variables. Individual variables include socially constructed identities and histories defined as education, family histories, awareness, and experiences of major events in one's life, and as well as attributes, that is the tendency to internalize or self-confidence, persistence, and even resilience, something that's very important in our work and one style of knowing, either doubting or accepting new ideas. For example, socially constructed identities are everywhere we look today. This is in fact the point of any post on social media and social media allows users to post information about themselves in an edited, careful and protective way. We'll also hear some about this uh, later on today. But also histories are critical in the digital age. Taylor includes the description of awareness and experiences of major life events as part of one's history. As more information about various critical life events become available online, such as civic participation, we adopt these histories and the critical life events as our own. As for example, Fridays for Future and Greta Thunberg's movement and how young people made this kind of event or this part of history their own. So for Taylor, um, she describes the social context around the first four levels of Bronfenbrenner's model specific to the learning environment. Examples of microsystems in this context include families and friends. And this has been really important uh, in a lot of the interview data that we've had where families and friends have become ex uh, extremely important in supporting learning during the last year. Also the microsystem is the dominating context for children and young people, especially in a digital world. Today, the mere activity of sending a snap to peers in, school, in a school classroom group alerts everyone in the microsystem to one's activities. In addition to any possible unfavorable upward comparisons, there are judgments and evaluations made via replies. And this is one way in which social systems are embedded in social media. Further, the context in which things are posted, photos with others, geographical regions, traveling and so on and so forth, also expresses the larger system in which we are embedded. So technology use across the individual lifespan can be thought of from a variety of theoretical perspectives, including Bronfenbrenner's ecological model, Johnson's techno subsystem theory, and Taylor's model for the development of young people. As relationships children and young people have with technology continues to evolve, these models can serve to illuminate what we might expect in terms of how the changing technologies will affect their lives and their individual psychosocial and relational development. So this is basically a presentation of sort of the way in which DigiGen is thinking in terms of a sort of model and hopefully contributing to further development and understanding this model. So thank you very much. Thank you, Katla. Very, very interesting insights there and a great setup for our next speakers. Um, I don't see any questions immediately in the Q&A, but as I said, you will be around all day to talk to us with any follow-ups that people may have. So thank you very much for that. This next section that we're going to look at has four speakers. We're going to be looking at the impact of technology on children and young people's everyday lives. 
So DigiGen includes four focus areas, family, education, leisure time, and civic participation. So each of our speakers will give a snapshot of research into each of these areas and open the dialogue on how to use the upcoming data for policy and practice. So do prepare your questions because you will be able to ask them all at the end. So we will have four introductory speeches and presentations um, of 10 minutes or so each, and then we will move into our plenary discussion. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A from the very beginning, in case by the time we get to the end of it, you've forgotten the question you wanted to ask at the beginning, because we'll try and draw together all those strands and see what we can weave out of it during our discussion. So with that, I would like to start with Olaf Capella. He is one of the senior research uh, coordinators at the Austrian Institute for Family Studies at the University of Vienna. Uh, Olaf's main research areas are evaluation studies on family policy and children's rights and child welfare, as well as the development and evaluation of sexuality education programs and violence research. Olaf, thank you very much. I am looking forward to hearing your comments. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, well, hello, thank you. I, um, welcome from Vienna. It's my pleasure that I have the possibility to introduce to you some of the insights what we would like to do in our work package, so-called work package three. We are looking on the technological transformation and of families by um, digital technologies. Um, by doing that, it's important to, to understand, right? Whoops. It's important to understand that this is a qualitative research where we're trying to see family in a broad sense. On the one hand, we are looking at children from five to six years and their families and children from eight to 10 years and their families. This qualitative study is done in Austria, Estonia, Norway and Romania. Um, that's what we call the so-called case studies that we are looking closer on the situation in four different countries within the European Union. And what we do with children um, in the family um, work package, we were focusing on very young children because what we see in research is that uh, folk, uh, research studies with younger children are really under researched. So that's the reason why we concentrated in the family area, basically on the family life with younger children, with five to 10 year old children. What do we do with them? We collect children in each country to different focus groups where we're trying to get kind of collective um, orientations of children and their experience with digital technologies. Then on the other hand, what we are doing is so-called family interviews where we in each family at least um, having interviews with three different participants of the family. In that sense, we really do understand family in a broad sense. It can be either the mother and the father of the child or the sibling of the child in that age group or even a good friend, an aunt, grandparents. So we would like to get different inputs from different perspectives on how that family is working and what kind of role digital technologies plays within that family. And on that level, we are very much an individual level of experiences. Very important research questions would be for our work package. How is family life shaped by the technological transformation by digital technology? And how do children really use and subjectively access digital technology in everyday lives? So we are not only interested in the terms of how do they access and on what kind of device do they access, but we are very much interested also what kind of software they are using, what are they doing? with digital technologies and how is their daily life within the family shaped and how is family life shaped by digital technologies. Of course, one of the central part is harmful versus beneficial effects on the family and, the, and on the individual. And then we do would like to look at diversity across families, diversity within families, diversity across different countries in Europe. And Sarah already has presented some of them. What I would like to present is first ideas, first things we see in our field work. We pretty much done with our field work yet. And then the big 
analyzing of all the data we collect that is starting right now. And I would like to share with you some first ideas what we already see. So on the expect, uh, on the experience role of digital um, devices within the family, what we clearly see is that the most common device in families is computers. This is Basically, in these age groups, we are looking at mainly used by adults over, or for fun. Then, of course, iPad or tablets and gaming stations like Nintendo or PlayStation, as well as smartphones. These are pretty much the devices children are familiar with in that age. Um, digital technology has penetrated all communities. Um, from impoverished to well-off families. Also, they seem to be very much different. What Sarah described, what we see, Romania is part of our country in our work package and what we see there, for example, um, that most of the children, even in the Roma communities in Romania, um, they know the devices, but not all of them know all of the devices we would like to ask them about. And eight to 10 year old children, they often have to master the devices not to have fun by themselves, but often because their parents are not able to and they have to master the devices on behalf of the parents. Possession has improved due to the COVID pandemic, as we already heard, because a lot of the children did get ta tablets from school. And as Sarah mentioned in her, um, I just would like to point that out, the, the digital deprivation of children, what you found out, Sarah and her colleagues, was 23.1% in Romania. On the other hand, what we already see, that five um, to six-year-old, one of the smallest ones we were looking at, they do learn a lot how to handle these uh, digital technologies by um, watching other family members and not so much by doing it by themselves. Children do have feel more competent and have more knowledge about the devices and what you can do with it than often the parents are aware of. And this is also true for the five to six year old ones. In terms of the use of ICD, the basically activity what we see from the children in the age of five to 10 is that they basically use the uh, devices for entertainment. This of course have changed for school kids to communicate with friends and of course watching videos. Almost all of the children are familiar with YouTube. TikTok is an interesting uh, uh, app, what we were looking at, and it is interesting to see the TikTok differs in the countries we're looking at. It seems to be that in Norway and Romania, TikTok is well known even with the smaller children. And in Austria, TikTok is not well known. Like this is the picture I put you there, what we introduced to the children, and the children sometimes realize in Austria what it is, but they not often use TikTok. It seems to be different in Norway and Romania, so we see differences here. Children are very aware that um, digital technology can have advantages and can have dangers as well. Often children mention, this is not good for your eyes, or, the potential risk of getting addicted. This is at least something what children heard or what parents trying to use to keep children from spending too much time on the digital devices. In terms of parental mediation, that we see that basically parents are very much concerned on the time children spend on digital devices. And what we can see, um, it's the very wide range from what kind of regulations are there and parental rules. Like in Austria, we have regulations for five to six year old ones from 10 minutes to two hours a day to once a week, one hour media time. And there also we see some differences in the countries we are looking at, like in Austria, families often do use a so-called family app. In the family app, this is run by the parents, you can put in how, how long children are allowed to be online. And then if the time is over, after 10 minutes, after an hour, after 20 minutes, it being automatically, the screen will be automatically blocked. What we see in Norway with introducing, I was interviewing with parents, we see that there is a very popular website um, where children, uh, where parents do get information that would be good for children. And it's pretty much obvious that parents really do trust that website and that they try to bring these kinds of regulations, their suggestions on um, their fam in their family, what's on their um, what they come, uh, what they um, ask for or give advice for screen time. There are common rules in families we see all over the country, like there is no device allowed at the dinner table. Um, and in general, um, the parental rules and the monitoring by parents in terms of time and in terms of content is very well accepted by children. 
and it's hardly questioned by the children in that age, but this may be also some kind of um, developmental thing with working with younger children, we have to look closer um, in our further analyzing. Um, however, even if children accept it, what it's already obvious that the age uh, that the children between age and uh, eight and ten already have uh, found their ways to avoid the rules and found tricks to get around the rules of parents. And what we would like to look at one um, topic as well is um, on for in terms of family practices. What kind of family practices was in the family? And we often see with these younger children that watching TV together, serious movies, this is a very common family practice within um, the most families. In contrast, the digital gaming, this is some mostly not happening with parents. It's basically happened with siblings or with other friends, but parents do not get very much involved with that. We also see with some parents that they do find co-activities on digital technologies or digital devices, not really as a family time. And so one of the suggestions we may could add or policy recommendation could be that in terms of practicing family, doing family on a daily basis, it maybe could be important for parents to see digital technologies as very important co-activities and um, to establish a family life. This is so much from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Olaf. Um, before we move on to our next speaker, I suppose we'll go for just as a very quick question because um, Barbara Buchegger is asking, when was the study carried out? Uh, in her view, uh, in Austria, TikTok is quite well known already, even amongst the young. Uh, she works for Safer Internet in Austria. Well, we are right now in the middle of um, the fieldwork and we almost finished it. So we carried out the fieldwork this year. And with the five year, we know that um, they know TikTok and they didn't realize it sometimes, but at least in terms of um, presenting something, at least our first impression is that it's the children are more active in on TikTok in Norway and in Romania, at least with the children we saw in Austria. Okay, thank you for, for clearing that up just as a comparative. Um, and thank you very much, Olaf, you're staying with us and we will have you in our plenary discussion in a little bit of time, just in about half an hour or so. Now, our next speaker is Birgit Eichelmann, who is the Professor for Educational Science at Paderborn University. And she leads the work in DigiGen on ICT and education. Now, amongst other projects and activities, she is the scientific director of the International Computer and Information Literacy Study for Germany and her focus and interest are on the development of schools and school systems and their courses in digitalization. So, Birgit, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Jennifer, for the kind introduction. And I hope you see my picture now coming soon to the screen. Otherwise, I'll start it here. So maybe the uh, host has to start the picture now. Um, uh, now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce work package, uh, work package five to you. Uh, this is about, now it's my picture on, thank you. Now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce work package five to you, to you, which is about ICT in education. And uh, as you might see that we are one of the four parts of the DigiGen project. We are uh, about education and we are one of the main areas and main topics maybe of the last month in the public discussion about how the pandemic also impacted children and young people's lives. But we are, as we are started with the DigiGen project right before the pandemic, we have some uh, overarching aims when it comes to ICT in education. First of all, I would like to uh, introduce our colleagues to you. We have five uh, of the eight DigiGen countries in our Work Package 5, it's Estonia, Germany, Greece, Norway, and Romania. And you see that there might arise from this already a large variety of findings and impressions when it comes to the European discussion of ICT in education. Uh, our main research question in the Work Package 5, which is focusing on ICT in education, is how do children and young people regard their education in terms of preparing them for future life in the digital age. 
And what we learned from the last month is that our research question has been of increasing relevance during the COVID pandemic and will still be of relevance also when it comes to plan for the time beyond the pandemic and overcoming, uh, overcoming all the impact that the pandemic had on digital education in these months. When you have a look at what we are doing in this work package five, you see that we originally planned for two tasks, task 5.1 and task 5.2. 5.1 is maybe the heart of work package five, which is about collecting qualitative data before children and young people uh, go to a formal transition in their school times. So for example, in Germany, we are first and uh, uh, now in the period of collecting data of uh, four grade uh, students. And, uh, and you see that we are planning to catch up with the students uh, in autumn again and uh, uh, looking, making them look back to, to the transition phase and also give their perspectives on ICT and education when they have changed the formal step of uh, um, the educational system. Uh, we are integrating children and young people in our, uh, in our research, but also to, uh, collecting data from teachers, teacher students and national stakeholders. So uh, going a little bit beyond what this was Sarah, um, um, what was Sarah uh, presenting here today and which mapped our background of digital education in Europe, we are in the DigiGen project also collecting, of course, uh, uh, empirical data. So the data we are collecting is deriving from this year and from last year, and we are also collecting some more data uh, in spring next time. But our focus this year will be on uh, this uh, qualitative data in the before and after transition phase. And moreover, we are collecting data uh, with video workshop. We found that this would be a great opportunity to uh, integrate students and young people in our research. And um, what we also find out in the discussion in this research group I presented to you before, consisting of these five countries, we found that some of the results we already collected and, uh, uh, and, and having, having integrated in our analysis cannot uh, be uh, interpreted by us as a researcher. And we need children and young people helping us, uh, giving their perspective also, uh, not only presenting data, but also helping us with the interpretation of data. And for that, we are conducting a video workshop in autumn. As you can see on the left side of the screen, uh, during the last month and during the last year, we added a so-called pilot study, a COVID add-on study, because what we've really felt is that uh, our research topic uh, got a little bit of shift and we had to include uh, the, the changes that uh, had been uh, yeah, in, induced by the COVID pandemic in our research. And from this, a working paper, which will soon will be published soon, uh, derived. And uh, I will give you some insights into our first results. So as you can see, we are just in the middle of data collection, but have already finished the data collection of the COVID add-on study. Uh, giving first insights uh, of the results of the COVID add-on study, we have uh, different uh, research categories that we are um, referring to. This is, of course, what also Sarah said before, the ICT access in and outside schools, but we are going much more forward also. We are looking at uh, children and young people's interest in ICT in school and beyond school. We are looking at aspects of mental health and well beings and stresses in the context of ICT in education. And of course, also at what uh, Hutler pointed out in benefits and risks regarding ICT in education. So giving some first insights uh, into our results, I would like to first uh, refer to the risks that were shared by the children and young people uh, integrated in our COVID at our study. And I would like to point uh, uh, to, to one quote um, provided by one children from Norway. And she said, some students did not manage to keep up and do what they were supposed to do by themselves. They fell behind in their work when we moved online only. So we see that also in the Northern countries, these uh, students struggled 
uh, with some challenges uh, when it comes to the online learning. And you see that many more aspects were uh, covered by the students. And what is really heartbreaking uh, is the, the quote from Greece, uh, in which it is said that the children and young people really miss their teachers when it came to online learning, and they felt distracted from learning uh, at their homes. And you see that not all, all children and young people have the same opportunities to learn at, uh, at home, and we need school as an institution for education in the digital age. Some benefits uh, arising from our research so far is that, uh, for example, here a German student said, so the positive thing is that you become more independent in learning when learning is moving online. And that was also a thing that made us make uh, thinking more a little bit into future direction and say what we can take from this experiences made due the, during the COVID pandemic and what are the benefits we can also take up for education and sh shaping education in Europe when we are going uh, with our thoughts beyond the pandemic situation. So I myself had the chance to uh, use this Digigen uh, experiences in an online dialogue so far with our Chancellor Angela Merkel in April. And we also had some uh, different opportunities to share our insights and research results in, in a national context, for example, here in the largest uh, national German study, uh, conference on empirical research, uh, which was held in March. But we are moving on and we are trying to share our results and discuss uh, our results with the public, uh, stakeholders, policymakers, and also in the research community. For example, at the ECR conference, which is held in, uh, in, in, uh, in, um, in Genova in, uh, in, in, in September, I think. And this is uh, uh, the main conference on educational research in Europe this year, and we are putting in here results from Germany and compared, for example, to Estonia. You see that we are working on several more publications, working papers, and also scientific papers, and also chapters which are, will um, provide an, an additional impact on the uh, book that is uh, provided in the in the project. Uh, and thanks to Hatler for organizing everything and uh, for more. Um, information, please follow us also on the uh, social media. We are publishing all our results uh, also in, uh, in open access formats. So we will share and discuss uh, our results with you in the next month and years. Thank you so far. Thank you very much, Birgit, for that. We appreciate that. And do, of course, remember that you can put your questions to Birgit. She will be staying with us for the panel discussion. Um, I haven't seen any in the Q&A just yet, so we will wait until we all come together to have a reflection. Our next speaker is Dimitrios Parsanoglu, who is the Senior Research Pantheon University of Social and Political Sciences and Assistant Professor at the University of the Aegean. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, Demetrius. We're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, Demetrius has a DEA and a PhD in sociology at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris, and has participated in several national and European research projects and extensively published on history and sociology of migration, unemployment, youth, urban space, and gender. And he is here today to tell us about the GGN's work on leisure time. So this is what we're looking at today. Dimitris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, I think it's a very, I mean, uh, the, um, my intervention comes, uh, fits very well after the intervention of Olaf and Birgit because we're, and there are some points that overlap with the other uh, two researches conducted in the other two uh, work packages. So uh, what we are examining in our, in our uh, work package, the basic research question is this simple but very difficult to, to, to approach. Uh, how uh, everyday practices linked to leisure are transformed, have been transformed, are transformed through the ICT use. Uh, 
what uh, the keywords, let's say, the main topics, the main objectives of our research is to um, tackle with what uh, Hatla uh, mentioned in her introductory note, uh, to, to examine how everyday practices linked to leisure of uh, leisure time of children and young people are transformed through ICD use. Uh, to try to understand and to develop comprehensive tools in order to understand this something that it is um, a reality for uh, for uh, children and young people, which is the fusion of digital and material spaces in everyday interactions, uh, something that uh, the older we, the less young people, let's say, or the older ones, uh, cannot really usually think in terms of, of uh, dichotomy. Uh, another uh, objective is to uh, to explore potential alternatives or uh, you know existing good practices that enhance social interactions and social skills acquisitions um, um, uh, among uh, children and young people, and of course the the last uh, point, which is very crucial, maybe it is the most um, you know policy relevant, is how to. Um, enhanced to help for the improvement of intergenerational communication. Um, either it has to do with the children and parents, uh, children and teachers, etc., on the on, on safety issues, risks and benefits of ICT. Five countries participate in the in our research. It is Greece, Austria, Norway, Romania, and the UK. And um, the methods that we are using. Um, we had to be creative from the beginning because also of the topic, the, the topic of leisure uh, being so broad and maybe a little bit vague, uh, could not really uh, be approached uh, through only through traditional quantitative and qualitative uh, research methods. So we try to combine in a kind of multimodal, multimodal approach several methodological tools. Uh, we are doing interviews. Uh, we are in the middle of, of our field work now, uh, and we combine the information, the data collected through uh, qualitative semi-structured interviews with uh, children from 10 to 15 years old with communication diaries uh, developed uh, through a smartphone application that has been developed for, by the University of Oslo. Uh, we also use a kind of participant observation in a kind of digital ethnography um, uh, kind, uh, watching and uh, interacting with children who are playing video game, Minecraft, uh, to be more precise. And of course, we will have a secondary analysis of available statistical data. Uh, Sarah uh, will uh, undertake this, uh, this uh, task. Um, I would like to refer today to some of the challenges that we have met. Uh, I have to... Uh, after designing all our research and uh, you know discussing and uh, finalizing our research design, we had to uh, go out to the real world, uh, which proved to be a surreal world. I'm talking about the, the pandemic. We had to face uh, very new uh, challenges. So that had an impact also in conducting while we were conducting our research. For example, the whole recruitment strategy that we had uh, designed uh, was irrelevant. Uh, we didn't have access to homes, even for uh, interviews or for game observation. So what we are doing is to use, um, you know, available uh, digital platforms for uh, interviews and also for the discussions during the game sessions. Another issue that I think is quite uh, also Birgit uh, mentioned it uh, is. Um, a kind of problem uh, for uh, for our research project in general is the um, is uh, we have to be really creative and persistent in order to avoid the two pandemic centered focus. What we are researching here is not uh, you know uh, only the last uh, months what is going on during this uh, last months of lockdowns and restrictive measures. Uh, but uh, we want to have a more a kind of biographical approach. It is quite difficult, especially for uh, the youngest ones. For example, we have uh, conducted interviews with 10 years old. Uh, for a 10 year old uh, boy or girl, uh, 15, 16 months of uh, lockdown is a very, very long time. So uh, it is quite difficult to, um, to have a more a broader, let's say, uh, approach scope. 
Another issue which is uh, policy relevant, I think, maybe it is the, the main issue is the, uh, how, we, how can we avoid paternalism? By paternalism, I mean uh, imposition of notions of uh, meaningful ICT use or um, of uh, forms of well being or uh, risky behaviors, threats, uh, vulnerability, etc. Uh, how can we avoid imposing them uh, to the children? We have tried from the beginning to, um, to adopt um, an approach that involves children and young people as co-researchers on their own terms. And we have been doing this uh, mainly through the use of, uh, of uh, the smartphone application where uh, children uh, are in fact uh, designing and, um, and creating, producing uh, the data that we are searching for. And another and last uh, challenge uh, is how to combine different types of data from different sociocultural settings. As we said, starting from the latter uh, five countries with very different uh, backgrounds and uh, social contexts participate in, uh, in the research. So we had to create from the beginning uh, cross-cultural st standards for comparison uh, by um, structuring our tools and um, uh, by drafting predefined categories and feedback through piloting, as well as consulting uh, the children. And uh, in order to, to, to combine different types of data, qualitative, quantitative, uh, audio, visual, text, etc., uh, we have the, our colleagues from the National Technical University of Athens uh, who work with us uh, have uh, developed a um, um, a tool which is called Knowledge Graph Notes, KG Notes, based on artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, that offers uh, analysis and organization of data based on the development of an ontology designed specifically for digital. So I am going to close with some questions that might be uh, policy relevant from, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are still in the field work. Um, some countries have advanced more, some others uh, less. Um, the main, the open questions that we have to face and it would be good to discuss uh, with you today is first of all, what kind of new knowledge? Uh, I mean, we have uh, some decades now of uh, you know knowledge production, research, and theory. What kind of new knowledge can be theoretically re relevant and insightful without just adding to the dominant user-centered approaches? How can we um, rethink, uh, even redefine, you know, um, the digital spaces that are created, particularly by uh, children and young people? A question that is linked to the previous one is how to avoid technological determinism and bridge technical and social configurations without overestimating or underestimating one or another. How to avoid, in fact, technological or even social determinism in order to understand, to understand uh, the next uh, question, which is we meet it uh, in our discussions with children, uh, it, how to build upon a reflection that understands digital and not digital, not as different spheres, let's say, but as one common space without just transposing to, the, to one or the other, to the digital sphere, for example, perceptions on processes and relations, uh, that come from the so-called uh, material uh, space. We have seen it repeatedly uh, for children, the digital and the non-digital sphere is a common one. They play, for example, in their symbolic game without any digital device, they reproduce the games that they play online. It is very, very common, even in the, for the youngest ones. And the last question, last but not least, which is really, I, I don't have any, I have some uh, insights uh, so far, but I do not have a clear answer, is what kind of recommendations or even interventions or good practices can bridge the gap between parents and children regarding the perception of safe and meaningful leisure uh, enacted uh, on, the, on the digital sphere. There, there is some distance and uh, of all the children that we have spoken to, they have talked about interventions at school or discussions with parents about safety, threats, etc. But uh, there seems to be a distance of how they define threats uh, and uh, safety. Thank you very much. 
Demetrius, thank you very much indeed for that as well. I like those questions. We may come back to them and actually spread them out more evenly amongst our panelists as well to see if we can all get an answer to them. Now, our last speaker for this section is Athena Karatogiani, who is Professor in Media and Communication at the University of Leicester. Now, Athena leads the research on young people's civic participation and says so she cannot make up her mind whether she's more interested in the empirical research or the theoretical problems emerging from ICT use by social movements, protest and insurgency groups. Um, Athena, I'm particularly very interested in this. Uh, on my recent Rights of the Child podcast, we discussed child empowerment, so it's something I'm definitely really keen to hear about it. Do we have your slides or your image yet? There we go, fantastic. Thank you, Athena, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, and um, I'm thrilled to Jennifer that you are looking forward to this. Uh, I hope I don't disappoint you. Uh, so uh, this is uh, sharing uh, some of our findings uh, today and a little bit of a provocation perhaps for policy what it might mean uh, although this is that we've just completed the first um, uh, the first uh, uh, phase of the study so we have two more um, now now um, what uh, what uh, the first phase was about was we conducted an ethnographic research which included online observation content analysis and 65 interviews in total in the three countries, uh, Estonia, Greece, and the United Kingdom. It was conducted between, the, uh, between September 2020 and April 2021. Uh, so it captures uh, a, a nice big chunk of the pandemic, I guess. And uh, it, what uh, the notographic approach wanted to do is to compare the reasons, the why, and the means, the how, how uh, youth engaged in civic participation, and, and we focused on a dominant um, mini case studies like dominant uh, youth movements mobilizing for uh, racial, social, and environmental justice during that period. Now, the second phase that we're doing now, we're conducting now, is uh, on digital storytelling, where we uh, get children between 16 and 18 uh, to produce what inspires and challenges them uh, when they um, engage in polit uh, politically uh, uh, online. And the third phase of the research is looking at digital citizenship and policy in each of the three countries um, at the national level and, and what happens there. So today I'm going to talk about the findings from this first phase of ethnographic research. Um, okay, so uh, what do participants engage, why do they engage in civic participation? So, and in that sense, what are the similarities and differences uh, by comparison each country? We're interested in uh, ideology, identity, community, um, uh, collective action, how they're framing messages um, to mobilize others, coordinate activities, and what are the kind of factors, socioeconomic gender factors that play out in there? And the, and the second question, is more about how do they do this, right? So it's about uh, these affordances, issues of surveillance, censorship, uh, online and offline uh, behavior, how the, the offline moves online and vice versa, I guess is a hybridity that um, Dimit Dimitris uh, talked about uh, that is very um, uh, important to think about. Now, in Greece, uh, we have youth activism mobilizing against gender-based violence. There was, a, let's say, a belated movement uh, in Greece uh, in the past uh, uh, eight, nine months or so, where were the revelations about um, uh, gender-based violence relating to athletes, to celebrities, TV personalities, and so on. So there was a, 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 an occasion of that. And then there was also anti-police brutality because it was triggered by certain events. Um, relating to the lockdown as well. And in Estonia, we have uh, a, a primary data youth activism mobilizing for LGBTQ plus and Black Lives Matter uh, on the back of the George Floyd murder in the United States um, in uh, uh, last June. Uh, it, was, it was just the anniversary, I think, that has just passed of that. And then in the UK, we looked at BLM UK and environmental civic participation, uh, particularly looking at extinction rebellion, but also extinction rebellion youth, which is uh, on average, uh, like the very low age in the, in the bracket of ages that we're interested in. Now, what we hope to contribute with this research is on um, general um, scholarship on digital citizenship, uh, which 
includes uh, questions that were discussed about access skills, literacy etiquette, communication rights, possibilities, uh, data justice, uh, digital inequalities, and so on. Then this domain is used by adolescents in particular. And in our team in Leicester, we have Di Levin, who is an expert on adolescent use on ICT, so we're very lucky. Uh, in that sense. And we also have digital activism scholarship uh, more broadly, which is the field that I've been working on in the last uh, couple of decades, I guess now, um, and where we were looking at broader issues, particularly uh, I'm interested in leadership emergence um, and how uh, the, the youth of uh, tomorrow is becoming part of uh, the becoming leaders in, in, in their youth activism. And also uh, we can contribute to youth political culture and digital activism citizens specific to each country. So this empirical involves um, uh, interviewing and examining policy uh, documents in each country uh, as well. So we can then uh, identify cross-cultural continuities and discontinuities that may emerge uh, in this comparison. Now, this is like quite tense, uh, but it gives you some kind of map of, of what's happening in the various case studies in its country. Uh, to put it simply, uh, what we have here, what we have uh, understood from the 65 interviews, and we did interview in the UK in particular, also older activists and asked them about their adolescent experience and digital development over the years and how experienced that as well. Um, what we found was that in Estonia, the participants were active for equal rights for the BLM movement and against discrimination for LGBTQ, but they were not, uh, they were less worried about issues of privacy and surveillance, right? In comparison to Greece and the UK, where we have far more worry, worry right? So that's something perhaps to do with um, the Estonian government's digital governance. They're famously in Estonia, right? And Catherine Tina can here, wonderful team there. Um, in the report, uh, this is explained uh, very well. Uh, in the in Greece, uh, Dimitris Parsanolo and his team, uh, what, what is evident there, there is far more distrust to political parties, which is uh, you know, a finding that uh, uh, is uh, uh, relevant because that's something that is well known also in political science, Greek political science but also in relation to commercial platforms. So Greek youth sees um, these are networks, um, ICT use, it's less a space for organizational strategy than, in, than the UK participants, for example, who are, uh, uh, who are innovating in terms of organizational communication, this organizational communication innovation and more widespread mentoring actually for yeah, youth activists than in the other uh, younger activists that in the other two countries, something that uh, was uh, a great, great to see in the UK, where you had, for example, the BLM uh, movement uh, here in Leicester in the UK, because it's a, a special city in terms of the demographics, it's over 50% uh, non-white, where you had pre-existing anti-racist organizations helping young people, right, to organize in terms of COVID safety rules and actual physical demonstrations. So they were helping them get permissions and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, and they were amazing in mobilizing, on the other hand, young people talking to young people, you get far more uh, mobilization that way, this is what we found. Now, the three countries, they have similarities. Uh, what we see is politicization is triggered by personal life experiences, um, specific events uh, surrounding inequality, racial, social and environmental justice. Do not forget that Greece has been through a severe uh, financial, economic, political, social crisis relating to um, uh, to, 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 you know, the, the, the big memoranda and so on. And then in the UK you had Brexit. So you had two very uh, significant, two truly significant events there that influenced how people participate uh, and use digital media as well. Uh, there are also similarity in platforms, uh, but the way they're used the, the differs. For example, in the UK, um, there was a clear thing where Facebook was used to reach older people and parents when they're mobile, the youth was mobilizing, for example. So it's very clear in TikTok um, and Instagram is more used in Estonia, for example, than in Greece, in Greece uh, and so on. Um, so um, to finish, and, and I hope I don't take too long, um, I will put in the chat the report and then you can like enjoy. It's a whole feast of quotes and wonderful um, voices that, that can be read there from, from these young people. I'm hoping to have storytelling videos um, created and co-produced like, co with, with young people as well. So the Polish publications that I wanted to put forward here 
is that in the three countries, there is anger, right? Surrounding inequality, racial and environmental justice. And that is very clear in, in, in different ways in its country because it's influenced by the political culture and the socioeconomic and structural conditions of its country. And the digital is a core of that structure now because of the, the pandemic digital by default. What I would say that you can make some uh, provocations in the sense that when you have better digital governance, such as in, in the case of Estonia, you might have, have more trust and safety, right, um, of young people on how they conduct their, their civic participation and this, uh, how they are these citizens. In uh, when you have more unstable government uh, or exceptional events, such as I would say the Greek the, the Greek crisis and Brexit and so, so on, you have less trust in politics. This and you have more polarization. These are countries that were split, uh, <laughs> civil war mode uh, in some cases uh, as well. Whole families not talking to each other, etc. Um, then you have uh, this idea that I think when you have less digital development. Uh, less, it is less that the digital networks can be seen for a space of coordination, organization of protests, such as is the case of Greece, where physical participation and the rule of the street, let's say, is, is uh, more prevalent. And uh, when you have more digital environment, you might, will have more innovation, such as the case in the UK. And I thought about this, and Katrina will like, and let us know in the, in the afternoon discussions that in the Sonia BLM case, you have jump scaling, that they're more able to kind of grasp uh, what's happening at the global level when, when they have, like, it seems that they have more global concerns because in Estonia, the, 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 it's not that there's a specific problem um, uh, with uh, Black. Black, the black population or minority, but if there is an ethnic group and minority that, that there's no movement about that, right? So you can see like what's happening, how there might be jump scaling um, and connecting to the global level in different ways than in the other two countries. Um, and, and that was it from me and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Athena. That was, a, that was very speedy and I really appreciate the, the details that you're putting in there. And of course, we put the link there in the chat to the, the paper there, Online Political Behaviour and Ideological Production by Young People. So please, I do urge all our attendees, when you've got a spare moment, do click on those links and have a read. Now, I see there were no questions yet in the Q&A and we are, I'm aware of time because we need to stop at midday for our lunch break. But let me bring back all those four speakers and ask you, let me start Dimitris with you because I think you mentioned that you saw parallels between the other speakers. Where did you see those and what would you identify? I mean, the there are some overlaps and uh, some of them are due to the COVID-19 uh, uh, condition. For example, the, the way that uh, children perceive uh, digital technologies now are, are affected are, uh, by the experience of, of COVID-19. And one of the issues is that um, uh, we have the chance also to work on the work package on education. We see that uh, they report that they are much more tired with being in front of in front of a screen and also there there has been some impact uh, regarding the the leisure i mean in terms of of space and of tools used uh, when you are uh, you know six hours in front of the of a computer in order to to attend uh, your class uh, afterwards, in fact, uh, this is what they, they have been saying, that uh, they needed to do something else, not just play a video game on the same computer where they have spent the whole day. This is the one thing. And the other thing that, uh, as far as families are concerned, we have seen that there is uh, negotiations within family about use of ICT for leisure is uh, always a question. There is a, there are always rules uh, in weekdays, in weekends, etc. How much time they are going to spend, and let me say that uh, there is also there is no participation from the part of the parents. Uh, you know, they do not play video games. In the best uh, case scenario, they just tolerate hearing them describing, you know, the avatars or the the gameplay, whatever you know. 
but there is no. While uh, in all, almost in all cases, I don't know in the other countries, maybe it is the same. Uh, parents encourage them to do some, you know, activities, but it, it is always something offline. There is uh, this kind of uh, this distinction is very rigid. I don't know. The colleagues probably have to say more on that. Thank you. Uh, there's been a reaction uh, um, again. She's saying, uh, "Were not parents uh, worried that children were playing online games instead of doing online learning?" Um, I suppose that is that is a, a possibility. Um, I would say, in personal experience, I know plenty of parents who do play online games with their kids. Uh, it can be something that can be quite bonding. Um, but Hatha, I'd like you to uh, join us. I think you have a, a comment to make on what you've been hearing. Yeah, thank you very much, Jennifer. I appreciate uh, all the presentations, and I think we 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 sort of tried to tie some of the things together a little bit today, this morning. Um, and and I think one thing that's really important to understand, and I think. It maybe it links a little bit to, to the question we had in the Q&A, but in, in some ways, because of the last year and, and the, the idea of screen time in many ways, which many parents are concerned with, has sort of fallen by the wayside in, in a sense, because the screen time has now changed to, you have to have screens to, have, to sort of function in life during this last year. And so I think there is not this sort of natural division between home, between school, between free time. So we don't get these sort of natural transition points. And certainly I think, at least in the family interviews that we've been involved in, I, I, we don't feel a sense of parents being worried that their children are online gaming uh, instead of doing their schoolwork. But I, I think that parents get a sense of really what children's lives are around school and education. And, and maybe we are also able to see better what parents actually do to support children's learning that has in many ways been sort of hidden from our view until this last year. So I think while, while we are not a COVID study, we, we can't ignore the elephant in the room. And I think we have to take into account some of these issues that have come up during the data collection and some of these findings and how this links to sort of, I, I think COVID has, as one kid said, pushed us 10 years in, into the future. Uh, we were going there, but we were going at a much slower pace. So I think, you know, there is, of course we do have families that, that do game, but it, it's not the norm. Uh, we have a few dads who are very big gamers and, and encourage the gaming issue, but, but it's, not a, it's not something that we find many families doing. Thanks, Hedla. Yeah, I'm speaking anecdotally about that, I suppose. Uh, Birgit, let me turn to you. Um, what sort of is the, is the teaching material like, uh, digital and visual quality teaching material like? Um, what are you experiencing there? Have you seen an improvement over time? Um, yes, what we actually learned during the uh, DigiGen project is that one pitfall of research is that we are always looking backwards. And when we are talking to children and young people, they are looking in their future. And uh, from uh, our data collection, we can see that they are pretty much into these digital technologies, but they don't see them as digital technologies, but they see them as substantial parts of their lives and their, their learning. And we have, we always as adults differentiate also as researchers between the old and the new things, but it's uh, all about their lives. And this also is manifested in their views on, on digital learning material. And so what we learned you now in, 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 our, in our actual, in our current study before transition is that the children and young people have great ideas about how technologies should look like to help them learning. That is what we uh, see from the very first interviews we are conducting now. So they are seeing the technologies as part of their lives, but not discuss it in a, in a positive or in a negative way, but move themselves a little bit forward. And this is what we can really learn from children and young people, not to look backwards, but to look for, um, into the future and take over the perspectives of the children and young people and this is what uh, maybe is always a pitfall in research. We are looking backwards and trying to learn something for the future, but uh, speaking to children and young people, you see they are looking in their future in, in their current life, lives. And so what has happened in the past 
is a little bit ignored by them. And this is uh, also what we I've learned from, from our children, young people we have interviewed and discussed so far. I suppose we're, we're, we're moving towards a point where the term digital native will be obsolete because there will be no distinction between whether a tool is digital or not digital. Um, let me let me look there. Athena, there's a question uh, for you uh, from Anja Vesh. I can see it. Uh, yeah. Um, I it's can see it. Question. So this one is uh, from Anka Veliku. Uh, uh, um, so yeah, so you're saying uh, if we're also interested, uh, uh, not so legitimate digital participation, like being against conspiracy theory, ideas like this. So um, yeah, so a decision I think was taken back in already in Oslo when we went to discuss this project uh, maybe three years ago now, I think, uh, not to look at um, sort of more, let's say, like um, discourses of uh, more extreme discourses, radicalization, like that kind of category, conspiracy, far right, the decision was taken uh, not to do that because there, there were um, other dedicated projects at that point uh, doing exactly that, like a, a whole consortium doing that. So that was a decision. Now, uh, personally, no for Digigen. Um, I am on an, another project that will look at disinformation in particular, in uh, uh, which was uh, like a Global Science Research Fund, one of the last that has been funded by the UK government, actually looking at disinformation and COVID responses in uh, four countries in Southeast Asia. Um, the Philippines, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and India. So, like, so, so I'm, I'm working on this area, but but not for this project, and it's a fascinating area. Um, yeah. Sorry. So I'm writing notes very fast. Um, but Athena, let me ask as a follow up: with, with children spending more time doing schooling online. Is there an opportunity there to maybe uh, teach them legitimate uses for, for sort of activism online? Um, so, so in in terms of uh, so so what uh, to, to to give you an example of um, of this uh, kind of thing when in the UK you had problems uh, with exams because of COVID and there was uh, kind of a, a bit of a fiasco with the, with the government in that regard. There, were, uh, there was a participant that organized with his schoolmates an actual physical protest, right, uh, in, in his city with 30 other people to protest that. And there were other people in the UK, other students of, of that kind of, that were affected by it, doing this kind of thing. So it seems that it is events that also trigger these things in the relating to schools. Uh, but uh, as far as I understand from the study, I contribute to, um, uh, to the laser, an ICT laser one, uh, what I find fascinating is that although there is uh, emphasis on internet safety and they get that kind of thing, it seems that there is less emphasis on the digital citizenship kind of area. Um, and, and, and unless it is to protect people from radicalization, prevent, I mean, in the UK in particular, in Greece, I don't think, and maybe the Mitis can correct me here, that there is anything like this citizenship in schools. But in Estonia, I think it is. And then you can see this difference there where youth participation is more confident and they're more trustful of both, like in a way, like their government and what they're doing there. So I think that in the third phase of the study, after we go through this storytelling, we'll, we'll be able to look at policy in schools, in the wider sectors, in, in what's happening in this country. And we're gonna be able to talk more, Jennifer, about, about this particular issue you're asking. It's a, it's a critical one, I think, especially because we have this disinformation, intentional, in, you know, um, uh, uh, fake uh, information like being disseminated and then people like propagating this without knowing it is actually not true information or distorted information through misinformation, right? So you have like, and then the malinformation, the sense of hate speech, racism, um, sexism and, and so on happening. So having young people engaging with this area is, is crucially important, yeah. It's a vast area. It can span so many different things from disinformation and and then to online activism, where I think sometimes you get 
uh, gets a bad name. It gets called slacktivism, whereas actually, you know, sometimes it's a. Well, it depends why you're doing a slacktivism. Some county is doing slacktivism about the BTQ will land you in jail, right? So it depends why you're doing that slacktivism and that sharing, yeah? I think so, but I'm, I'm getting derailed and I wanted to bring Olaf in to have, have a word on where he sees the overlaps and the possible synergies between these different areas that we've been talking about. Well, I see the overlaps very much in um, the topic of pa parents and families, as we said. And since I'm involved in Work Package 4 as well, I do see big differences if we're talking about smaller children and older children. Like, like we see that even 10 to 15 year old ones say, the older I get, the less rules I get. And that even shows to me that younger uh, parents with younger children are even more helpless. And as you said, Jennifer, I would be critical. I think we don't really see it yet as far as I see it in our work packages over all Europe that we already have a digital city, uh, uh, generation because we do not look at the people which are missing out especially due to COVID which we have lost in school and there are hundreds of which we have lost in school and I see the tendency here as well that it's very tempting for us discussing digital technologies with young people um, with teenagers, with almost young adults, but we don't discuss them with smaller children. They also have dangers. The parents are very helpless. Um, they often um, go to very strict rules instead of seeing the very positive part digital uh, technology can bring to children's life and can bring to them as a family. And I think this is where we as DigiGen Consortium have to see that we have to find advice and policy recommendations across our different work packages because family is responsible for children till 18 or above 18. And this is a very wide spectrum. If we start with five-year-old ones and their first steps in digital technologies, and then if we continue over 10, 15, and then seeing them almost independent using the internet, what Latina is talking about. And I think that will be the charming part of our project, but also the difficult part to see what do we get out of it. Thank you, Olaf, very rapidly. Thank you very much for keeping us within time there, because I, mean, I must say, and this is before we even get into teaching children how to code. I mean, this is we're even talking about use rather than design. Um, I'm going to, because we, we did run a little bit over time, I'm going to let Anami Dueskind has a question. So we'll take it before we break for lunch. Um, one of the concerns many parents have is the devices that are very often sleep robbers. Did that come out of your research? Concerning civic participation, did you look at the massive worldwide online mobilization during the school strikes? in favor of the environment. So uh, people like Greta Thunberg and so on. Um, Athena, I can see you were going to type an answer, but perhaps um, to many of our other speakers. Um, Olaf, did you see this concern of parents being, you know, we, we see the concern of parents that um, if children spend too much time on, but we also see it with children being very aware. Like there was an 11 year old one in the work package four, which were gaming. And she said, I learned if I'm playing too long at night, I can't fall asleep because the blue light and being so hyper of the gaming, it will cause my sleep. And you do see that young people, even very young one, develop strategies how to avoid negative outcomes. Like one boy was telling, if he he's gaming, he forgets to drink. So instead of not dehydrating, he gets ha the habit that he puts a glass of water next to him. So I think parents do discuss, you have to get sleep. And the children, even the smaller ones, we ask them a very situation, a small kid goes to bed with, in a secret with his smartphone. And all of the kids said, no, it's not good for you. You have to sleep. So children already have that in their mind. And of course, it's a discussion as one of the other negative outcomes, which parents fear in terms of technical digital technology. Demetrius, perhaps I could bring you in on that, yes. Just to add something that comes from older children. Uh, has been, we have heard that in uh, several cases that uh, you know there is this rule that we don't use our mobile phone or in, in bed, uh, etc., and because of addiction and uh, maybe you know. Uh, but uh, from 13, 12, 13 years old, uh, what we heard was that uh, okay, I don't agree that this is a problem, but I do not really fight for that. <laughs> it's uh, okay. My mother is afraid of that, so I you know you know. Yes, I think it's, it, it is also something that has come from older children about threats and things that were frightening from, from them. Traumatic experiences uh, 
come from an early age, I think, because it is, uh, they mentioned them, this, the fear that they have felt uh, watching a video or something retrospectively. So it is interesting to see how they deal with it when they get older, but it starts uh, from a very early age. Yeah. You're good. Uh, you wanted to add something, I think. Yes, I would say that this is also a task for formal education, for example, for schools to make uh, children and young people being aware of their media use and to support competences in self-regulation of media use. And we as adults always make it black and white and see it critical when uh, when ICT is used for, for leisure and for, for sure for gaming and uh, see it uh, in a white color or in a white color when it comes to educational purpose of uh, media use. But we have to uh, adapt that, uh, have to understand this. This is part of uh, children and young people's life that both is important for them also to develop their personalities and we make them help to find their ways through the digital world. And I think this is an important task for uh, ICT in education and in formal education, especially in schools. Thank you. And uh, Athena, I will give you a brief word then so that we've heard from everyone on that question. Uh, yes. So I, I think that what really fascinated me was the more like the uns and the hidden informal, like subjective uh, on the go strategies that children developed when they're online. And so an example of that was a child that said, of course, because we're asking them, are, are people different online than offline? And they had uh, uh, like great things to say about that. I mean, for instance, there was a child that said, well, my friend is more aggressive online because they own the world, the, the Minecraft world we're playing. So they have understanding of that, but also they develop strategies. For example, one child said, it was about 11, I think. And he said, well, you know, of course I, I go online and I'm different people and I play personalities online because with the pandemic, pandemic is so boring. So of course I go and I pretend I don't know how to get in the game and stuff like that. or. I don't want to be impolite, but if somebody asks for personal information, I say my internet is down or I have to go um, like the thing is not working or something like that to be polite. So actually they, they develop their own strategies that are informal that perhaps they could util be utilized by schools as well. This is how these children are coping right, to, to inform tactics that they can share with children beyond the sort of standard internet safety stuff that they're like blurbing now in schools, right? So that they, they'd learn from what children actually do to cope uh, with being online, online, for example, yeah. Well, thank you very much for that, Athena, and thank you indeed to all of our speakers. I think that was very, really informative to hear from the different silos as well because sometimes it can be sort of a such a hugely overwhelming topic that actually breaking it into manageable parts is is quite useful so thank you i really do appreciate that we're going to take a break